call is now being recorded. Okay, we'll go ahead. So yesterday we started the wisdom books, the books of poetry. And we looked very briefly at Job. We looked at the overall summary of what exactly God was trying to convey through that particular book. And uh, today we will very quickly try to look at Psalms and Proverbs. Um, we are almost reaching November. We are running out of time. So we will have to do two books at a time. Uh, so we will look at both Psalms and Proverbs today. All right. So um, Psalms, as you know, was not written by just one author. It is true that um, David is believed to have be, to have written 73 of the Psalms. Um, but then there are 12 of them written by Asaph. Uh, there are nine Psalms written by the sons of Korah. Uh, three Psalms have been written by Solomon. And you have a Psalm written by uh, someone named Ethan. Also a Psalm by Moses, which would actually be Psalm 90. So he too wrote a psalm. And um, then there are 51 other psalms, uh, which nobody very uh, is very sure as to who exactly wrote those psalms. So we have multiple authors writing these psalms. They were written uh, during different periods of time, obviously, because Moses' psalm would have been written when he was alive a long time ago. And then there were even some one or two psalms which were written in the post-exilic era after the people have come back from exile. So you have a wide variety of Psalms um, covering uh, almost 900 years. Uh, so originally, when we look in the Hebrew scrolls, the way the Psalms were arranged in the Hebrew scrolls, they had divided them into five books. So you basically had five books of Psalms. And I think that's mentioned in your textbook. Book one. Uh, was chapters 1 to 41. Book 2 was chapters 42 to 72. Book 3 was chapters 73 to 89. And in book 4, you had chapters 90 to 106. So of course, the last book, book 5, uh, covered the chapters 107 to 150. So originally, when the Israelites um, put the Psalms into their scrolls, they made it into five sections, five independent books or sections. And um, there's no specific theme for each of the sections, but I think that's just how they found it convenient to divide it. Um, you know, whoever did the final editing and compilation chose to place it in those five different sections. Now, there are mainly four kinds of Psalms. Uh, some will say there are seven types of psalms. Some will even say there are ten types of psalms. But there are four main basic kind of psalms which we need to be aware of. The most popular, of course, are your messianic psalms, which talk about the Messiah. Um, uh, can, I mean, would any of you know, just like that, you know, out of memory, uh, any one popular messianic psalm without looking at your textbook? Which um, you know the one where they they it talks about how they divide his clothes among them, and it just happens you know before your Psalm twenty three, which talks about you the shepherd and very very popular Psalm right. So it's easy to remember Psalm twenty three is about the shepherd. Psalm twenty two talks about many things which completely you know, are in line with what happened during the crucifixion time. He talks about how his tongue was you know, uh, completely parched, that it stuck to the roof of, his, uh, you know, uh, of the mouth, all of those things. So Psalm 22 is one of the most uh, popular messianic psalms. Uh, you have the pilgrim psalms, which are uh, Psalm 120 up to Psalm 134. Now, these are psalms which people sang even as they are traveling towards Jerusalem for the different feasts. So during the time of the feasts, you would have hundreds of people coming to Jerusalem because they want to celebrate it at the temple. So even as they're making their journey from their various towns, as they are traveling, they would be singing these psalms along the way, which I think would have been very interesting because you would have uh, grown-ups and children every and everyone joining in. 
not because they have to sing but just for the fun of it you know because they're they're on the road they're traveling and it's going to take many days for them to reach and as they are traveling they are singing and preparing their hearts to come and celebrate so those are your pilgrim psalms uh, or the or what they call journey psalms which are uh, which were sung while the people were coming to jerusalem to celebrate um, the annual feasts you have acrostic psalms which you must be you know have heard of so uh, which is the most popular acrostic psalm where you have alphabetically the first alphabet of the hebrew uh, language you know aleph so the first verse will begin with aleph the second verse will begin with uh, bet which is similar to your b you know so then the third will be gimel so like that way you know uh, so you would have um, according to the alphabet hebrew alphabet you would have each verse beginning with that particular alphabet those are called your acrostic psalms and the most popular among them is if you your psalm 119 you know the lengthiest psalm so each begins with one alphabet okay? so yeah, it, it's um, it's written in that pattern and again once you have all the alphabets being covered it again starts with the, with the first alphabet so in that way you have this very very lengthy uh, psalm then you have the imprecatory psalms these are the most controversial psalms and um, i think your textbook actually gives you the some of the main ones these are not the only imprecatory psalms there are many many more but what exactly is an imprecatory psalm these are the psalms where the psalmist is crying out to god and saying lord bring judgment upon these people for what they have done to your people so um, uh, these are uh, psalms asking god to bring down judgment and the wording is strong Uh, you have wordings like you know lord smash their babies against the rocks and it sounds very horrifying and chilling uh, so um, most people say that oh these are very unchristian psalms should never should not be you know using them any more uh, then why is it that god allowed those psalms to be part of the scriptures okay so the way we need to see these imprecatory psalms is that um, the psalmists are not taking the vengeance into their own hands they are saying lord you are the just judge so in your time you because of your righteousness you bring judgment upon these nations do to them what they have done to us to our families to our children the same things that you have seen them do to us now lord you judge them for that and so god in his perfect timing he will wait he will wait generations for them to repent and change their ways and when the time comes he will unleash the judgment upon them so in these imprecatory psalms they are not saying i am going to go out and take revenge they are saying lord you do it in your time in your way so you see they are these are healthy ways to express one's anger um the psalmists are not taking matters into their own hands they have clearly understood deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 35 where the lord says it is mine to avenge i will repay so the lord will do it in his time according to his plan and the psalmist is only crying out to the lord and asking the lord to do that also another thing that we need to understand about the imprecatory psalms is that the, it's not just selfish self centered anger in most of those psalms if you look the uh, the main uh, complaint which is being made is that the innocent people are the ones who are being oppressed it is the innocent who are suffering it is the weak and helpless who know who are being taken advantage of and so the psalmist's heart is um, wounded he is grieved to see what is being done to the helpless and so he cries out and says lord take action against this wicked who think that god can do nothing that god is not able to see but lord you who are seeing what is being done to the weak and the helpless you o oh lord fight on their behalf so it's not just selfish anger but rather it is anger which is being expressed because of the horrible injustice which is being done and also in some of the imprecatory psalms you know the psalmist cries out and says lord you know glorify your name you know because um, the wicked are mocking god they are thinking that god cannot see that god is helpless that god cannot do anything to them and so the psalmist cries and say cries out and says lord show them who you are show them your might let them know you know so these are not just 
uh, words of selfish, self-centered anger, but rather they are righteous anger which is being expressed against the wrong that is being done. And um, another thing that we should see is that um, even in the New Testament, you have godly, righteous anger being uh, you know, expressed. Uh, we'll just look at one example. Um, Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. Oh, yes, we had some people responding here. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm just seeing it now. Um, you know, if the laptop was, were at eye level, I would have been able to see. Uh, so, yes, um, Psalm 2 is a declaration. In fact, maybe we, if we have time, we will look at Psalm 2. Um, and, uh, of course, Psalm 22 talks about um, the messianic prophecies of Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, yeah, where were we? Yes, Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, if someone could read out. Okay, so here, um, uh, which version is that? Ah, uh, yeah. So let them be accursed. Uh, in in an IV, it gets very uh, more plain because you know it's you know English used today's English used, and so it says over there, "Let them be under God's curse." Okay, so even in the New Testament, you do have writers calling down curses upon people, and it's being done uh, out of a desire for righteousness. Because these people are preaching a wrong gospel, and people who innocent people who believe in this wrong gospel are going to think that they are saved, but tomorrow they will end up in hell because of these uh, devious, corrupt, evil preachers who are preaching something wrong. And so over here, very plainly and openly, Paul says, let them be under God's curse. Because knowingly, they are manipulating the truth. And they are presenting a wrong gospel. And uh, so he expresses his anger against them. So righteous anger is justified. And righteous anger is good when it is expressed in line with God's will. And it is carried out if God says, you know, let, uh, that he will use you as an instrument of, uh, of, of uh, discipline or correction. Then if you walk in leading with him and carry out the disciplining or correction according to his will and his guidance, then yes, it is justified. It is correct. Uh, yeah, you had put up your hand for something. Yes. Psalm 1. I would say it would be a didactic psalm. For, for because it's talking about how the person should live their life. So I would, like I said, there are many types of labels given. It just depends on the scholar who is giving the labels. So I would personally call it a didactic psalm because it's teaching uh, us to live in a particular way. But then there would be many, many other labels given. You two can come up with a commentary of your own and give your own labels. As long as you're doing it wisely, you can actually come up with your own labels. Yeah, someone else was saying something. Uh, in in the um, no no it, it's given in the textbook. Oh cool okay. Yeah. Um, okay well, uh, yes. Um, oh I think Nina meant to say Psalm twenty two and then she wrote Psalm two I suppose. Mm. Oh, yeah, the NT reference. Okay, that would be Galatians 1, uh, verses 8 to 9. Uh, you also have 2 Peter 2, 12, which also, you know, talks about uh, righteous anger. Um, yeah, coming to Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is something that, you know, we are, uh, is very popularly quoted. It is a messianic psalm. Uh, and if someone could read out Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, Okay, so uh, Psalm 2, um, the psalmist is writing that God has said, you are my son. Today I have become your father. You can take it at two levels where God is talking directly to the psalmist and saying to him, 
you know i am now your father on the other hand you can also take it at, a, at the second level where it is not only being spoken directly to this psalmist it is also being spoken as a word of prophecy of something which will happen many many years later to the messiah so it's not just referring directly to the psalmist but also to the coming messiah so uh, or the messianic psalms will have two levels it will talk about incidents which are currently happening in the time of the psalmist but it will also refer to things which will happen much later on in the time of the messiah so here uh, it's referring to jesus christ as well and why do we say that this psalm is connected to jesus christ simply because in hebrews chapter 1 verse 5 again in hebrews chapter 5 verse 5 they are taking quotations from this psalm you know um maybe we can just read out one of those um yeah hebrews chapter 1 verse 5 if you could read out mm wow Oh yeah, yeah. Psalm two is very much messianic because I mean we are talking about that right now. Uh, but I was just wondering whether you meant Psalm twenty-two and then you wrote Psalm two. Uh, just a thought in my head. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I didn't quite listen to what you were saying because I was busy reading here. Yes. Okay, so here in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is pointing out that when God spoke these words in Psalm chapter two, He was not just referring to the psalmist; He was also referring to something that would happen later. And uh, so He says, God never said this statement to angels, but He was saying it to the Messiah about the high priest, which you know the book of Hebrews talks about. Uh, again, in Psalm chapter two, verses eight to nine. um you have um, things which are mentioned and those get repeated in the new testament as you know uh, fulfillment of what was prophesied so if we could just read out psalm chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 please hmm so the exactly uh, and uh, so we see the fulfillment of that in revelation chapter 12 verse 5 where it says uh, it's talking about this um, vision and then it says she gave birth to a son a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter okay so in uh, psalm chapter 2 verse Nine. It said, "You will break them with a rod of iron." And the same thing is repeated over here about this male child who is born, where it says, "He will rule all the nations with an iron scepter." Then we have Revelation chapter seven, verse nine, uh, where uh, what is mentioned in Psalm two is again repeated over here. So um, maybe we can have one person read out Re Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. Okay, so Revelation chapter seven verse nine talks about a great multitude that no one can count, uh, you know, made up of people from every nation, tribe, people, and language, and it is a fulfillment of the prophecy made in Psalm two verse eight, where it says, "I will make the nations your inheritance." What is the inheritance of a king? it is the kingdom that he is going to be ruling right so his kingdom are are these people people from every tribe people language and nation so they are his inheritance uh, the messiah will receive all of these peoples as his inheritance and then it says the ends of the earth your possession so who are the possessions uh, of god they are all his servants he possesses them he owns them and um, uh, they choose to you know glorify him and live for him so whatever has was prophesied in psalm chapter 2 we see the fulfillment of that happening in revelation chapter 7 verse 9 um 
how much time do we have? Maybe we could just very quickly look at another psalm, or is that too risky? Okay, we'll just try to look at one more psalm and then you know get into Proverbs. Uh, this is going to be very tricky trying to do two books at one time, but it has to be done. Uh, so Psalm 18 verses 1 to 2, you have a lot of images being used because yesterday we were talking about metaphors, you know, uh, things which were very familiar to the Hebrew people. So if someone would say God is like a rock, they would immediately understand what that means. But for us, it sounds very strange that God should be compared to a lifeless uh, chunk of stone. Okay, so um, this is the way they understood these things. So if very quickly, if we can look at Psalm 18, verses 1 to 2. Um, yes. It's a good translation because uh, they have translated it as, the Lord is my rock, which is correct. Then it says, my fortress, which is also correct. And when you move on to the next phrase, my God, my rock, which is actually correct. Because in uh, some translations, they change that second rock into strength. But actually, the literal wording over there is rock. My God, my rock, in whom I will trust. So there are two different words used over there for rock. At the very beginning of the verse where you have the Lord is my rock, you know, the first phrase, um, it's talking about uh, rock. Um, it's talking about something which is at the, the very top of a mountain. It's like a cliff. It's like uh, at a very great height. And to reach it, you'll have to pass through very narrow, you know, gorges, very narrow cuttings in the mountain. And the person who is standing up there on the top is in a very safe position. If any enemy tries to come up, you know, going through those narrow cuttings in the rock, this person can already see him from above and he can take action against him. So over here, when he says, the Lord is my rock, he's saying, I'm in such a safe place as long as I'm in him. As long as I'm at the center of his will, obeying him, taking shelter in him, believing in him and putting my faith in him. It's like as if I'm there on that cliff. Even before the enemy comes, I will know because God will tell me when there is danger and then I can pray against that. I can claim his security and his help. So he says, when I'm in the Lord, it's like I'm on that cliff. I'm almost untouchable. Nobody can come. No enemy can come near me. Okay, so that is the phrase that is used over there. Coming to the second uh, phrase where it says, my God, my rock in whom I will trust. Now over there, the, it's a different word that is being used. Here it's talking about an open plain, uh, which is there on the mountain. You know, you must have seen a lot of pictures of these things in National Geographic and stuff. You have mountains, but sometimes in the mountains, somewhere at a high level, you have open plains, you have grass growing, and you have, um, um, you know, you have this um, Incan civilization, very popular for tourists nowadays. Peru, you know, in Peru, they have that Machu Picchu, you know, so, you know, so those are plains, right? And those plains are not down in your valley. The plains are up there, but you have grass over there and you have houses which, which those people built in those days. Uh, so, uh, so the second word that is used over there the, in the second phrase, my God, my rock in whom I will trust. Again, it's the same meaning. It's like as if, you know, I've, I'm in the, on this plain, nice greenery uh, around me. Water supply is there, and I've made my home over there, and I'm safe. You know, if any enemy wants to come, they'll have to come all the way from the valley up over here on top to attack me. So in the Lord, it's like as if I'm in the rock. In the Lord, it's like I'm, if I'm, I'm on that high plain where no enemy can come. So for them, these wordings would have carried such deep meaning. And we who are now, you know, in a completely different context, we don't catch the beauty of those terms. Um, okay, I'm this is getting risky. I should move on. But just to explain the other phrase over there, because it's so beautiful. Uh, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, it says, right? So over there, that word fortress, it literally is that word matsud, uh, which, um, which can mean just a fortress or a palace. But it can also mean a particular geographical spot. Because in the Judean desert, you have this mountain which is called uh, Matsada or Matsud, you know, however you pronounce it. And uh, 
it's a very high steep kind of a mountain and right on the top you know if you if you were to type in your google m a s a d a you would find pictures of that right on top at, on, on on the very summit you have this large open space and that was considered a very strong uh, place to have a fortification so they say that um in um, yeah in first samuel chapter 22 verses 3 to 4 they say that most probably david took shelter over there on the masada over there up, up there on the top you know when uh, he was being chased by saul and later on uh, this herod builds a strong fortification over there much later when the maccabeans are making their last stand against the enemy they uh, they also you know go and hide themselves over there and then the romans come and they try to um, uh, not the romans who was that uh, antioch syrian so they also come and uh, and attack uh, try to attack the masada so it's talking about that fortress a summit uh, right on top of the mountain summit an open plain which was over there so here he says the lord is like the masada we're not very easy for you to approach it not very easy for you to capture it so these are all the terms which they used in their hebrew poetry because those things held special meaning and significance for them okay let's not neglect poor proverbs because proverbs is also is an excellent book of the old testament and in proverbs again we see there are multiple authors we have solomon who is uh, who has written you know many of the proverbs but we also have another two writers lemuel and agur they also have written um, some of the proverbs and the thing to understand about proverbs and i think this is mentioned in your textbook don't know whether it's mentioned in your textbook or not uh, they generally say that proverbs are truisms that's a term that is used t r u i s m s they are called truisms in the sense what is being said in the proverbs is true and it and it and we see it working out as true on many many occasions but it doesn't mean it's a promise and that will happen to you in that particular way every single time let me take an example and then we can you know uh, discuss this further uh, if someone could read out for us proverbs chapter 12 verse 11 Oh my do I have the wrong one Proverbs chapter 12 verse 11 about a farmer Okay so it's talking about a farmer who tills the land very faithfully okay he's looking after his farm very 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 faithfully such a person he will be satisfied with bread now this is true right i mean 99% of the time you know you work hard you you put fertilizer in your in your in your farm you grow the crops it works you are satisfied with bread because you are not being lazy uh, you are using honest hard work and you will get the benefits but what if it's an year of famine then you will also face hardship what if there are invaders who come and burn up your crops then you would get into hardship so the proverbs contains truisms which are true because that is the way god fashioned the world to function but uh, you cannot say that it will always work in that particular way because there would be times when god would permit something negative to happen but that doesn't mean that in, you know, in the end god is not victorious he will bring about his purposes he will work things out for good for his people but generally um, i mean because you know you have uh, one uh, proverb which always used to get on my nerves it says uh, a wife is like a you know dripping roof constantly the water is dripping 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 constantly creating frustration now that is not universally true right so it's a truism yes it is true that if a, if a wife is a, you know someone who goes on uh, troubling her family and always is you know constantly troubling her husband it's like a dripping roof but it doesn't mean that that's the case always so these are truisms which express uh universal truths which can be observed in the world but it doesn't mean that it applies to every single case and it will always happen in one particular way 
okay so uh, that is something that we just kind of need to understand about uh, all the proverbs uh, which are mentioned mm. chapters 1 to 9 mainly uh, discuss proverbs uh, for the young people chapters because you know, it talks about you know follow the instruction of your father and listen to your mother and all of that uh, there are many instructions for young people in chapters 1 to 9 uh, chapters 10 to 24 uh, talk about um, there is a lot of contrast being done uh, between the righteous man and the wicked man so chapters 10 to 24 it talks about different issues of life talks about uh, you know uh, uh, trade and commerce talks about uh, morality different issues are discussed but also there are many many proverbs in this particular section uh, contrasting the righteous and the wicked then you have chapters 25 to 31 uh, which are mainly written for leaders they they are trying to impart wisdom to leaders on how exactly to govern and how to rule um, and um, in fact it says in proverbs 25 verse 1 um, you know it says these also are proverbs of solomon which the men of hezekiah king of judah copied so during Hezekiah's time, he has his people write down these particular proverbs in, 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 in a new set of scrolls because Hezekiah cared about ruling correctly. He cared about being a good godly leader. It was important to him. And so it specifically says that he took the effort of making new copies of this section of proverbs you know, during his time. Um, so these are just some very brief um, facts about the proverbs coming to maybe one important aspect that we can you know touch upon um we can read out these two verses and then discuss them because they are the most popular verses in in our uh, uh, you know in our proverbs proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 if someone could read out Proverbs 9.10. So in Proverbs 1.7, it says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Proverbs 9.10, it says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And there are two separate words being used. Okay, so in your Hebrew, knowledge would be that and uh, your uh, wisdom, on the other hand, would be kokma. They're two completely different things. Uh, so what is being expressed over here? The fear of the Lord, when it says in Proverbs 9.10, is the beginning of wisdom. It's not talking about some deep, philosophical, profound knowledge. Kokma is a word which is talking about very practical, very simple, everyday wisdom which you need for life. It's uh, We can translate it in this way. Kokma is basically the ability to live well and the ability to do things well. Very simple. Kokma, that wisdom, is basically ability to live well and to do things well. In the sense, how do you live well? You are able, with the help of God, to separate the good from the bad. So you choose to make the correct choices. You choose to live in the in a way which God has designed. And so when even as you do it according to God's way, separating the good and the bad, you are able to live well. And you're also able to do things well. You, you're no longer a shabby worker. Your work is no longer substandard because you love the Lord. You want to honor him. You want to please him. You do things with excellence and he helps you to be excellent. So this is a very practical wisdom. It's, uh, it's the ability to live well and to do everything that you put your hands to, to do it well. It is simple, everyday kokma. Okay, that's the word over there. That is wisdom. And how does this wisdom come? It starts off with fear of the Lord. Because you honor him, because you love him and want to give him your best, you are choosing all those choices you know in your everyday life how you treat people uh, you know what you choose to do and what you choose not to do these are all decisions which are coming out of your fear and respect for the lord and so automatically in the process of fearing him and honoring him 
you automatically find yourself living well and doing everything well and you will stand out from the rest of the crowd the other verse proverbs 17 is talking about the fear of the lord being the beginning of knowledge that is the word daat now your knowledge over here is not talking about just head knowledge um it's talking about how you have examined something in great detail you have spent time looking at it examining it understanding how it functions and um, now at a personal level through experience through everyday experience now you know okay this particular thing functions like this you maybe you can use uh, you can use this that uh, uh, you know for a farmer a farmer who really now knows his land he's been working on that land for 30 years 40 years he knows exactly uh, you know in which season uh, it will grow which crop best he has examined it he has literally you know worked with it now he knows from ex personal experience he knows his field okay so over here knowledge is, is about something which you have examined and which you just don't know as practical information in your head it is something which you really know through personal experience and this kind of a knowledge it says also comes from a fear of the lord and here in proverbs verse 17 it's specifically talking about knowledge of the lord how to have a personal knowledge of the lord even the demons have a intellectual knowledge of god in fact maybe if you were to if you ask if you were to ask the demons to write an essay on the character of god they would give you an essay you know because after all they've been alive for centuries and they know everything about god you know of course no one can know everything about god but at least in their limited understanding but we believers we have a practical experiential knowledge of him which has been gained by walking with him with suffering with him sharing in his sufferings we have uh, learned what it feels like to obey it we have learned what it feels like to submit we have seen the joy of you know receiving his rewards we have seen the uh, the, the surprises that he you know releases into our families we have an experiential knowledge of him and that's the kind of that which is being talked about over here so how do you gain that intimacy with him how do you gain that kind of knowledge of him it happens when you have reverence for him when you you know walk with respect towards him on a day to day basis and uh, so um, in deuteronomy uh, okay let's just drop that and um, how much time do we have <laughs> okay all right uh, so maybe we can just you know i'll just give you two references um deuteronomy 113 where it says uh, choose some wise understanding and respected men from each of your tribes and i will set them over you so here it's talking about wise people in the sense these are people who have been making the right choices they have been separating the good from the bad and they know how to live well they know how to live right that would be your deuteronomy 113 on the other hand in second chronicles chapter 2 verse 7 where you know you have it translated like this send me therefore a man skilled to work in gold and silver so here to the same word for wisdom kokma is being used but over here it's talk not talking about someone living well it's talking about someone who is able to do things well okay so this is these are two aspects of uh kokma the two aspects of uh wisdom coming to the knowledge of the lord um psalm 9 10 could be one example where it says those who know your name trust in you for you lord have never forsaken those who seek you those who know your name trust in you because you see they have spent examining him getting to know him learning through experience how he is with them in different situations what are the things which he allows into their lives and why he allows it and how he brings you through it this is knowledge which has been gained through personal intimate walking with him and such people trust in him why because experience they have been with him they have experienced him they have tasted him now they know that they can totally stand on him no matter how big the you know storm no matter how uh, strong the enemy doesn't matter because they have experienced him they know him so that is what it talks about in psalm 9 uh, uh, verse 
10. Okay, so these are the two important phrases, uh, wisdom and knowledge, kokma and daat, which are used in your book of Proverbs. Uh, okay, we are almost out of time. Anyone has any questions? Okay, uh, uh, there's no question at the moment. Maybe we could just look at one other thing, you know, from uh, the book of Proverbs. Um, talks about wisdom as a person in chapter 9. Okay, Proverbs chapter 9. It talks about two women. Now, these are imaginary women, not actual historical, physical persons. Uh, but, you know, just two concepts. Wisdom is presented as a lady. And foolishness is also presented as another lady. So you have two ladies. You have lady wisdom and you have lady foolishness. And uh, this, there's a contrast between both of them. Now, many scholars have been debating and arguing and saying, why were wisdom and foolishness portrayed as women? Why not as men? Is there some reason? You know, so they, they could have very clearly said, no, man wisdom and man foolishness. Why are they being called lady wisdom and lady foolishness? Uh, and uh, people come up with different kinds of answers for that. I think the simple answer for that is that whenever uh, a, a feminine imagery expresses something best, God uses that imagery. Whenever you have a masculine imagery being you know, able to express some part of him or you know, some part of some concept, he just uses that. For instance, you know, there are many occasions where God uses uh, feminine images to describe himself, right? For instance, Jesus in uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, he says, How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks. So here, Jesus uses a feminine imagery of a hen which looks after its chicks. You know, when, it, when it's raining, it, it, it spreads out its wings and brings those little ones under its wings to protect them. And Jesus says, I am like that hen. That's what I wanted to do for you, Jerusalem. But you, Jerusalem, were not willing to come under my wings. You're not willing to come under my um, shelter. And then in um, Hosea chapter 13, uh, verse 8, um, God describes himself to a mother bear. He says, you know what happens when you, when you try to uh, you know, take away the cubs from a mother bear? That's it. All fury and uh, rage and anger and nothing can stop that mother bear. It will come after you right until it drops down dead, it will just keep coming after you because you have touched its cups. And the Lord says, that's the way I will defend my people like a so Over here, wisdom is being compared to a woman simply because, uh, uh, you know, women bring out that nurturing aspect. If you notice, it's usually the mothers and the wives who place the rest of the family members first and then they tend to place themselves last when it comes to you know feeding them uh, if, if you observe lunchtime the rest of the family gets served and only after everything is you know done then the mother sits down and then she eats it's just a very natural thing i mean nobody ever told uh, you know uh, you know little girls when they were born you no know, nobody gave them a book of rules and said you know what when you grow up this is how you should be you should put yourself last and put the others first no it automatically comes from inside when they become wives when they become mothers, they automatically start. You know, that, so that nurturing nature which is there uh, is brought out by this uh, wisdom. And uh, the other thing about uh, wisdom, um, I mean, about this imagery of a woman is that um, uh, they also give birth to new things. Um, you know, because it's not uh, the men who give birth, but it's the woman who gives birth. So the imagery used over here is of uh, of wisdom as a woman, because when you walk in wisdom, you are able to birth new things. Okay, so it's just because of that that wisdom is personified as a woman rather than as a man. And in uh, this uh, uh, Proverbs chapter nine, a very nice contrast is brought out between these two women. Do you want to be someone who will follow Lady Wisdom, or do you want to follow someone, uh, you know, do you, or do you want to be someone who will follow Lady Foolishness? Why? Because uh, you need to think about it. Because these two ladies are very, very different, and there's a description given. What does Lady Wisdom do? It says that uh, in you know verses one and two, she builds up her house, she sets up its seven pillars. It says she has prepared her meal and mixed her wine. She has set the table. She has made all the preparations. 
and now she's saying come come there's a feast which i have prepared and you can partake of it you can enjoy it you know you can have a wholesome good life so she has gone put in a lot of hard work and now she's inviting you on the other hand when you look later on in the chapter and you look at lady foolishness what is this woman doing didn't bother to make any preparations nothing she's just sitting over there at her doorstep and she's making false promises she's come inside nice things are there waiting for you inside but actually what is waiting inside um it says in chapter 9 verses 16 to 18 if someone could read out this please yeah and then the 18 yes so uh, she actually lady foolishness is being compared to a prostitute she is sitting over there on her doorstep and saying you know you come and said there's something nice awaiting you you know stolen goods are inside and you can enjoy them but it says over here the people who are getting invited little do they realize that inside is literally hell the mouth of hell you know that's the that's the actual literal wording over there if you look at the hebrew it's like the jaws of hell are opened and waiting for you and when you go inside you're going to get swallowed up that is all that's waiting for you inside so um, here the writer of proverbs is presenting these two women and saying now whom do you want to follow isn't it better to follow lady wisdom who has put in the, all the hard work and made the preparations for you to feast your way through life how do you want to follow lady foolishness who's making brilliant promises sitting over there on her doorstep but inside there's nothing there nothing there except death awaiting you okay so you have all this beautiful imageries which are brought out in the book of proverbs yes may it be a short question mm -hmm. are they lady wisdom and lady fool they are some have followed lady wisdom and have kept their oil burning on the other hand uh, some the other uh, virgins were following lady foolishness and they were unprepared so i would not say that they were lady wisdom and lady uh, you know virgin wisdom and virgin foolishness no i would say they were followers of some of them were followers of lady wisdom some of them were followers of lady foolishness as uh, i mean someone you know, i know in the class just making a comparison between the 10 virgins uh, story and uh, this well okay um yeah so many things that could have been discussed but that will this is supposed to be old testament survey so we are just surveying we don't we cannot get into the details okay so we'll just finish with a word of prayer uh, let's pray lord we just thank you so much that there's so much richness and depth in each of the books of the bible o lord through the inspiration of the holy spirit you have put in things over there which we need for life uh, for abundance uh, for prosperity and shalom and lord if, if we choose to study these uh, books if we choose to really spend our time meditating on your scriptures we will open our lives to an entire world of shalom and prosperity and and uh, abundance o lord So help us oh lord uh, to create the time to spend in your presence so that your holy spirit can start teaching us these things and revealing these things to us thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much for all of you who you know who contributed online as well as those of you in the class